not be going back to watch that recording, but <laughs> you're welcome to do it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Very generous. Excellent. So, um, yeah, before, you know, her group just like suddenly just starts now. It's so different than before. So, uh, <laughs> so I will put out the, uh, the request for announcements if anybody has any announcements for her group. Well, we do have one opening left, right? We do. The final opening, it's, I believe it's April 26th. We're definitely looking for a Herb Group speaker. <laughs> you like a cricket noise button. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> chirp, chirp, chirp. Could make it a Cuban missile cricket and then uh, <laughs> drive everybody off the, uh, off the Zoom call. So, uh, well, we'll just put that out there. We need to we need to continue looking. So, um, so Dave, did you did you ever hear back from from Gabrielle? No. Okay. So uh, we should try other other. Uh, we'll try. Uh, we'll try her again. Okay. Sounds good. With only one slot left, we don't want to put out too many offers. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, do we have any other um, announcements to the HERP group? Observations? Wasn't so bad with the, I was out with the vertebrate natural history class this past weekend and we definitely saw a few HERPs, not too many snakes, just the rattlesnakes were, were out. But uh, we saw five salamanders that we could see at Briones, which was, which was nice. Uh -huh. Seems like the Tarikas are not breeding. I mean, we, we weren't able to go to the, to the lagoon side, but we ran into some people from the parks who said that they were out doing surveys and that it seemed like the Tarika mating had sort of failed this year. I, I actually went to the lagoons this weekend in Briones and I didn't see one Tarika. I, I went up to like three separate ponds. I did hear some uh, Sudacris though, but no, I didn't even see one Tarika. It was very weird. Amazing. The Tarikas are definitely breeding now at the botanical garden and there are yeah. hundreds of eggs, eggs, egg masses. Egg masses. Oh, excellent. <clears throat> there's some I over in the San Francisco. And a friend of is reporting that a friend of that they're falling into ponds in Livermore, into people's pools and garden ponds and whatnot. So they're moving around, but not getting where they're supposed to go, I guess. Yeah, apparently a couple of weeks ago that there were a lot at the all in their breeding condition at this uh, junky little pond that's at the Bear Creek staging area entrance to Briones. And when we went there a week and a half later, there were no there were no tarikas, there were no egg sacs, there was nothing there. It was a little surprising, but we saw lots of tarika under logs. We just didn't see them, you know, in the one little bit of water that we visited. The other little pond that's at that entrance that people may know was just dry, as dry as it could be. They're also breeding over in the uh, Peninsula Watershed in San Francisco in the uh, San Francisco Water Department project. And I, I have to ask, uh, Kay, you mentioned in Livermore. Yeah. Um, are, are they seeing Tarika or maybe maybe even seeing Ambistema? Oh, no, they're Tarika. But, okay. but okay. I don't know which species because I just, a neighbor, a friend of my son's has been sending me pictures of her coworkers who've been finding these things in their ponds. Okay, good. Tarika, I don't know what they are. And I said, just find them some water, put them out there. But yeah. Yeah. I, I asked just because there's a, a big project that's proposed in Livermore that is saying they don't have ambistema when they really do. And so I'm definitely open to observations in the area. Uh, I've seen the pictures, they're not ambistema. Great, thank you. I know ambistemas fall into swimming pools. I have a friend out in Morgan Territory who's always fishing ambistema California and out of this pool. Definitely happens. Um, well, I think that... Um, well, I was, I, Jim, if, if anyone cares, I was up in the Kern County area just looking for the these Batrigoseps that keep they keep trying to list uh, Cymatus and Stebbins eye. Uh, it was really dry, uh, but and there was only one reliable spot. It was one of these tricky things where it got wet and then it was just windy for a week and everything at the surface dried out. Uh, all the canyons were cold and too dry. Um, and, and there were a couple of Goldilocks spots where someone found a Cymatus up Bodfish Canyon where some snow had melted. And then there was a one Stebbins Eye spot. I posted a photo to everybody there for one of the animals. Uh, a really strange spot, which is very exposed, but there's cracks down into the substrate. 
and there were big animals up pretty consistently, but no juveniles yet. Um, anyway, that was my most recent. I'm back up there finding stuff, but nice photo. Yeah, so that's a that's a, that's a Bob Hanson. at Bodfish. Yeah, a spot that Hanson and, and Brad Alexander got animals maybe 30 years ago. No, not 30, 20 years ago. And uh, yeah, they just got another spot up there. And there's a landowner there who seems open to more exploration. So we're trying to get some more localities here because they're trying to list that thing. So it was, good. it was a good find. That Ben Witzke pulled it, Dave. <laughs> All right, very nice. Thanks for the photo. So that photo is Steven's eye, you said? Yeah. Where, cool. where did you put, oh, there it is, I see. Yeah, it's, it's linked to the chat. Yeah. All right, so it, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Kelly Robinson, who I just met on Zoom here. So I don't have her full background, but I know a little bit about her background. So uh, she grew up in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, she did her undergraduate at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. And, uh, and then it looks like you spent about a year or two doing some research uh, before you went off to graduate school. So some of that research was in, was in, uh, was actually at Indiana State University. So with Michael Lanou, I mean, a well-known herpetologist, Michael Lanou. Um, and then after that, she went to my alma mater, San Diego State University, where she did her master's. And I assume you did your master's with, with Rulon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> the research we're going to hear about, I assume, is your master's project, right? Excellent. Yeah. And so she did her master's there in that fabulous program. And then after leaving San Diego State, she joined um, Chris Feldman's lab at the University of Nevada, Reno, where she's a PhD student now. Um, I actually don't think I've heard what you're actually working on for your PhD research. Maybe you could mention that to us before you jump into your, your presentation. Yeah, you might be shocked, but it's going to be the Newton Garter Snake system <laughs> that Chris, you know, is famous for working with. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm hoping to dive a little bit more farther into their resistance and uh, possible sequestration and a little bit of predation um, and understanding that. So it's really just in like the novel stages of that. COVID really kind of messed up a lot <laughs> of everybody's lives, including my own, of starting any of this research. So it's just been a lot of kind of hanging out right now. <laughs> right. I mean, you began in the program in August of 2019. Yeah. Which means that you had basically a semester before things went off the rails, right? Exactly. And that was the semester I was actually finishing my master's degree because I hadn't quite finished it before I had moved up here to start. And so Chris was kind of giving me some leniency to finish that. And then, of course, COVID happens. And right when we're starting to get going on all this. <laughs> wow, crazy. Well, so... Um, Thank you so much for agreeing to give this seminar again. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your talk. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you guys all for letting me uh, do this talk. I'm excited to share this. Share my screen here. So yeah, because of COVID, I have not gotten to share this material with anybody actually, like completely in its whole, whole story. So I'm excited to, to be able to share this with you all. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be about my master's work that I did on uh, rattlesnakes and small mammal prey looking at their co-evolution. So co-evolution is just gonna be this, sorry, I'm gonna put my annotation on, hopefully that works. Um, co-evolution is- Kelly, uh, are you sharing slides? Cause I don't see any. Oh no, yeah. Can you not see these? No. Nope. I can I see them. them. I, I, I see them. them. I see okay. them. Wait, really? <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I'm not them. Yeah, uh, I want you to see them. Am I the only one that can't see? Apparently. Somebody else. Stop sharing. Okay. Well, I guess I'll, I'll shut up then. <laughs> let, me, let me try to share it again or something and see if that helps. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. It's going to be a lot more enjoyable if you can see it, <laughs> but. <laughs> That's okay. If I'm the only one with this issue, it's not a problem. So please you have go. multiple ahead. screens set up or something? I would, yeah, I did put that on. We'll see. Okay. Is your shared screen maybe hidden behind another window? No. Oh, wait. I see it. <laughs> there. Zoom just changing stuff up on. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> no, it's all good. I'm glad you can see this. See the slides now. 
Um, yeah, so just getting into a little bit of what coevolution is. So coevolution, you know, is this fairly common phenomenon that we see occur in nature. A lot of times we see it occurring between mutualistic species interactions, as well as between antagonistic predator prey relationships. And so coevolution is simply just where you see these reciprocal evolutionary changes, meaning that those interacting species are driving each other's evolutionary tra trajectory trajectories. And so John Thompson first proposed this geographic mosaic theory of coevolution uh, way back, I think in the you know, early 2000s, if not before that, which simply just states that this geographic mosaic theory of coevolution is that these long-term dynamics of coevolution may occur over large geographic ranges, and these species may adapt and become specialized to one another differently in these varying regions. And this often uh, re ends up with these hot spots and these cold spots. So these hot spots, um, which are denoted by the red and orange in this figure, hot spots are just areas that you have this really intense reciprocal selection occurring, which drives a lot of these populations to have counter adaptations and adaptations to one another, which can lead to local adaptation. So local adaptation just meaning that these species are interacting, they are really intensely uh, putting selection pressure on one another, which drives, again, adaptations and counter adaptations and makes them more well suited for their local environment versus other environments. And so just the opposite of that would be our cold spots, right? So blue in this figure is showing all these cold spots, just where these species are um, interacting but they're actually not putting a lot of selective pressure on one another, not leading to any um, adaptations, counter adaptations with one another or any sort of coevolution. <clears throat> and so that local adaptation, like I was just mentioning, has been studied in a lot of different systems. Um, one well-studied system is of crossbills and lodgepole pines. So these crossbills are enacting a selective pressure on our pine cones via predation. And due to this, these cones have begun, um, the pine cones have evolved to become larger and have thicker resin. And therefore also in response, crossbills have also started to evolve larger bills in order to try to get at those seeds still. So these two interacting species are causing these phenotypic changes in one another over the course of a lot of evolutionary time. And the system is a nice little pairwise system. It seems really nice and clean. You can see the really good phenotypic changes. Um, the selection pressures have been really well annotated and noted in literature across many, many generations. However, this is not as simple of a, a relationship as it seems. You, in areas where red squirrels also coexist with these uh, crossbills and lodgepole pines, you actually get this interruption of coevolution. So these uh, squirrels also predate upon these cones, which enact its different selective pressure than birds do. And so <clears throat> this is introducing another coevolutionary relationship between the squirrels and the, and the pine cones. And not only does it make a new coevolutionary relationship, it also disrupts that coevolution that's occurring between the crossbills and the cones as well. And so exploring these coevolutionary relationships when there's multiple species involved is really important and can il illuminate a lot of patterns that we see, such as character displacement, cycles of uh, escalation and de-escalation, as well as coevolutionary alternation, which is just, you know, the shifting of species compositions over evolutionary time can then drive coevolution to, um, to change in magnitude and direction um, across the landscapes. And so we thought that this is really important, you know, when you have these multiple species, it just really changes the dynamics of coevolution and what's actually going to be occurring. And so we decided to try to explore this multi species coevolution in rattlesnakes and small mammal prey. So as all of you I'm sure are familiar with, rattlesnakes exhibit this really noxious venom that has been shown to evolve based on their prey type. And also mammals have shown, um, have evolved numerous anti-predator defenses, often some of them specific to rattlesnakes. And so one specific anti-predator defense that these small mammals exhibit is an innate venom, uh, innate physiological venom resistance. And so in many areas though, these prey have multiple predators. Not only do they have you know, predators across all types of taxa, they specifically have a lot of rattlesnake predators. And on top of that, all these predators of rattlesnakes usually have many uh, prey items that they can choose from. So this impacts of these spe uh, multi-species interactions and coevolution and that idea of local adaptation with uh, the geographic mosaic theory stemmed our main question for this research um, being that how might having multiple predators and prey with similar offensive or defensive strategies 
meaning we have our predators that all share the same venom, and then we have um, prey that share this venom resistance trait. And so how might having these multiple players impact their co-evolution in these areas where they're all coexisting with one another? So before I really start to dive down that rabbit hole with you guys, I'm just gonna back up and give you guys some more details just about rattlesnakes, their venom, as well as what's known about venom resistance today. <clears throat> so as all, all of you guys are aware of, pit viper rattlesnakes are these limbless predators that have evolved unique strategies in order to subdue and consume their prey. They accomplish this by being opportunistic cryptic ambush predators that feed on a whole variety of prey. So these rattlesnakes will wait for their prey to come within their strike zone, which is about half their body length, before they rapidly propel their heads forward and simultaneously erect hollow fangs in which they embed in the prey body. They then release a dose of venom and then release that prey item. And so it's really important that a lot of these, these snakes release those prey because mammals specifically have really sharp teeth and claws that could cause significant damage to the pits and the eyes of these snakes, which are essential obviously um, in their hunting style as well as just lifestyle. So after they release that prey, it takes some while for that venom to actually immobilize that prey item. And <clears throat> so the prey will get some distance away before those rattlesnakes rely on their chemosensory mechanisms, which is comprised of their nasal olfactory and their tongue flicking vomeral nasal system. They use this system in order to track a chemical trail that is left behind by that envenomated prey in order to locate the carcass. And so it's pretty clear from this, this strategy that they have that their entire efficiency of foraging almost depends entirely on how efficient that venom can actually subdue that prey item. And so venom is made up of this huge cocktail of toxins. It's made up of a variety of enzymes, polypeptides, amines, and a whole bunch of biomolecules. And these different toxins in that venom cause hemorrhaging, edema, tissue necrosis, and eventually death in the envenomated prey. And so although venoms are this huge cocktail of toxins, we tend to see one or two types of venom arising. And those two types um, are creatively named type one and type two. So our type one venoms are these high metalloproteinase activity venoms. They tend to be a lot less toxic. The LD50s towards mice are a lot lower. And it's pretty typical viper venom that we see here in North America, um, like such as the Eastern diamondback rattlesnake generally has this type one venom. Versus our type two venoms, which are low in this prote protease activity, and they're a lot more toxic. So as many of you are also familiar with our Mojave rattlesnakes, they have that crazy neurotoxin in their venom. So type one is a bit more hemorrhagic and type two is a bit more toxic. Um, so these tenderizers, as they're often called in type one, is a lot, like I said, pretty typical of viper venoms. And so <clears throat> one large class of these type one venoms is called the snake venom metalloproteinase, or SVMPs, as I'll probably refer to them as. These SVMPs are found in really large quantities, usually in viperid venoms and colubrid snakes, so they're a really important uh, toxin. And on top of that, they're considered a gateway toxin. So SVMPs are the cause of that initial destruction of cells and blood vessels when uh, something gets envenomated. <clears throat> and it causes a whole bunch of shredding basically of the muscles and all that. And then that facilitates the spread of the other toxins in that venom throughout the prey's body. And so again, this venom is made up of a whole slew of toxins and this compositional makeup has been shown to be really, really variable. Um, it's been, many species of venom has been pretty well studied. We're getting into more uh, novel techniques with transcriptomics and all of that, but uh, many studies have looked at the variation and Chapeau et al did a review back in the 90s and just showed that this venom composition can vary from intergenus all the way down to intraspecies, meaning that we can have population level differences in venom compositions. And so rattlesnakes are born venomous, obviously. And so that venom is all synthesized prior to them having any interaction with their environment, their predators or their prey. But in fact, those seem to be the factors that really drive the evolution of venom. So many studies have looked at how diet influences the venom composition. And specifically in this study by Gibbs and Maxey back in 2009, they looked at rattlesnakes that preferentially fed on ectotherms and rattlesnakes that preferentially fed on mice. And what they found is that those that fed on ectotherms had a really ectotherm toxic venom, which is more reflective of that type two venom I was just talking about. And then the other rattlesnakes that preferentially fed on mammals <clears throat> tend to exhibit a more mammal toxic venom, meaning more of those type one tenderizer type venoms. And so 
as I previous, uh, as I said previously, rattlesnakes are opportunistic. They'll pretty much eat whatever they can fit in their mouth. Um, but what they do is they generally actually experience this ontogenetic shift in their diet as they age. So when snakes are really small, they have small limited gape sizes. So they tend to eat a lot more ectotherms when they're young. And then as they age, they tend to shift their diet to more mammal diets, which means that you see that shift in their venom over their lifetime from an ectotherm toxic venom to that type one mammal toxic venom. And so in response to this, you know, highly noxious, super variable venom compositions and that ambush predation style, many mammals have evolved anti-predator behaviors. These behaviors can be used for a whole slew of reasons. Um, some are often used as signaling displays. Shown here um, is a tail flagging by a ground squirrel. So in all these videos I'm about to show you, the red arrow is pointing to roughly where that rattlesnake is. And as you'll see, the signal squirrel approaches and just keeps flagging his tail back and forth, kind of giving a heads up to the snake and others around him that there's a rattlesnake there. Other behaviors can be used as strike deterring behaviors and such as throwing or kicking substrate at rattlesnakes, as you'll see here. There's a kangaroo rat and he just, oh, let's see if I can play that again. And you see him, he just foot drumming away and kicks sand at the snake. We actually have a video where a K rat sat there and buried a snake for five minutes straight in just like a ton of sand. And it was one of the greatest videos. <laughs> but other, video, uh, other behaviors can be used as evasive maneuvers. So also shown here with that kangaroo rat, you can see their giant evasive leap backs that they do in order to get out of the way of rattlesnakes. Kangaroo rats are just amazing what I've learned. And even more fearlessly, kangaroo rats will also actually kick snakes in the face. So I have to show this video because these are my former lab mates, Grace Freemiller and Dr. Malachi Whitford, who studied the ninja rat, which I'm sure many of you have seen this video floating around. But these K rats will actually kick the snake in the face and remove those fangs before that snake can actually envenomate the K rat. Those little things are just truly deserve the name ninja rat because they're insane. <laughs> But other signals can also be used as chemical signals, such as ground squirrels and rock squirrels have been shown to chew up shed snake skins and then apply that scent to themselves in order to try to like mix up the chemical signals. And so all these behaviors I just showed you are really important um, and they all occur prior to any envenomation actually happening. And so what we're focusing on is what happens after all these mammals get envenomated by studying this innate venom resistance that mammals express. And so when I'm talking about resistance, I'm talking about the prey's ability to prevent those toxins from harming them. Uh, this is different than prey immunity. So more often than not, these mammals that interact with rattlesnakes and get envenomated, they can't necessarily walk away completely unscathed. They, some, they usually have some semblance of um, reaction or aftermath. Um, but what's interesting is that um, all, of these all of these animals, these crazy different taxa, um, show the same innate venom resistance. So we have European hedgehogs, ground squirrels, and, and possums, as well as mongoose, and at least 30 other mammal species that all, all show an innate venom resistance. And what's interesting is that all of these diverse species have independently evolutionarily converged on the same method of venom resistance. That method being this expression of snake venom metalloproteinase inhibitors. I will probably refer to these as SVMPIs or just inhibitors throughout this talk as a heads up. Um, but these inhibitors are just proteins that are in the blood serum of mammals and they act as a suicide substrate. And what that means is that those SVMPIs bind to the SVMPs irreversibly and therefore that stops all that initial destruction of cells and blood vessels. So it's actually helping prevent the spread of other toxins throughout that prey's body. But just as that venom composition was super variable, many of the past studies have also showed that mammals' ability to resist venom is also highly variable. Past studies have looked at snake species, so such as Biardi and Koss here. They went to go study rock squirrels, which have this really large range across North America. And in this range, right, it covers Arizona and New Mexico, they have a ton of different rattlesnake species that those rock squirrels can interact with. And so the main takeaway from that study was just that these rock squirrels exhibited varying levels of resistance um, towards all these different snake species that occurred in their range. And they were a bit more resistant towards the snakes that did occur in the range versus snakes that were outside of their range. But it's not only important what species is present, but also how many of those snakes are there. 
So past studies like Porn et al. have looked at how snake densities influence venom resistance. And what they find in their study is that populations of squirrels that came from really rattlesnake dense areas had much higher venom resistance than mammals that came from really low dense rattlesnake areas. And in fact, um, another follow-up study by Koss et al. looked at the idea of relaxed selection and how that's affecting venom resistance traits. So they took a population of squirrels that had been resist uh, that had been removed from rattlesnakes, and then they were actually able to bat calculate through genetic distance and radiocarbon analyses that those mammals uh, lost about sixty percent of their resistance ability in only nine thousand years. So these mammals are also pretty rapidly losing that trait when they don't actually need that trait to um, defend themselves. And a lot of these past studies, so they allude to this site-to-site -site variation, but finally Matt Holding, who I know gave a talk to you guys not too many years ago, so um, you guys are familiar probably with this exact study, but Matt Holding did a study about geographic location where he took 12 populations of California ground squirrels and Northern Pacific rattlesnakes, and he tested them and looking at venom efficiency, venom, um, venom resistance, as well as looking for any local adaptations. He was trying to look at that geographic most theory across a larger range. <clears throat> and what he found, like all other studies, a high variability in resistance, a high variability in venom efficacy. But one of the most interesting findings, um, in my opinion at least, is that what he found is that the rattlesnake venom tends to be more um, efficient at tested against their sympatric prey. So their prey that is in the exact same population as them. Versus when that, that venom is tested against an allopatric prey, it doesn't work uh, nearly as well, meaning that those allopatric prey have more resistance towards them. So it's shown in this graph by this reduction in this SVMP activity. So what it just means, this decrease here is just showing that those allopatric squirrels reduced that SVMP activity substantially compared to the sympatric population. Just showing again that those snakes are locally adapted to be more efficient with their sympatric populations, that they're sharing this really long co-evolutionary history with. <clears throat> and all these studies are great and we've learned a ton from all of these studies, but a lot of times they lack some degree of ecological realism just because these mammals and snake species don't occur in isolation, which is how this is frequently studied. And so we try to address some of those shortcomings by trying to understand individual variation in venom and venom resistance across multiple co-distributed species. So I was doing this work down in San Diego. And so we had four main species. We took our Southern Pacific rattlesnakes, our red diamond rattlesnakes, our California ground squirrels and our Bryant's wood rats. And we chose these four species because they readily occur across all of our sites, as you'll see. Um, and they broadly co-occur in this coastal sage scrub habitat. But on a finer scale, it's actually found that these species in, um, inhabit different microhabitats. So our Southern Pacific rattlesnakes and our ground squirrels tend to prefer these grasslands and rocky or and uh, riparian type areas versus our red diamonds and our wood rats tend to prefer these rocky outcrops and chaparral type habitats. And so not only do you have these tighter, tighter linked relationships between Southern Pacifics and squirrels and red diamonds and wood rats in terms of their habitat use, but this is also actually reflected in their diet as well. And so there's been a few different studies. Um, I think this is one of the most recent ones that I found that shows that the Crotalus river, our red diamond rattlesnakes, significantly preyed upon neotoma, which is our wood rats, a lot more than they did our, our uh, squirrels down here. So Otospermophilus would just be our California ground squirrel. And then likewise, our Helleri, our Southern Pacifics here, they ate a lot less wood rats and they had more um, squirrels in their diets. And again, this is reflected in not only this study by Dugan, but a few other studies as well in the past. And so we have this uh, tighter co-evolutionary relationship uh, that we assumed between these sets of species. And so those in informed a lot of our hypotheses. So we have four main hypotheses that we were testing with this experiment um, or this research here. The first one is just simply that we expected our snakes to exhibit significant variation in their venom compositions between our species and between our populations. Similar to all previous studies, we just expected that there was gonna be this variation between them. Our second hypothesis that we wanted to test was that individuals venom resistance towards one snake species is not going to be predictive of their resistance towards another snake species. 
just meaning that that inhibit inhibition factor in those mammals is not like a general a functionally generalized trait. It's not going to work the same against all the same species. Our third hypothesis is that mammals are going to be more resistant towards those SVMPs of the rattlesnake that most commonly preys upon them. And so for this hypothesis, we were really driving those microhabitat differences and the diet differences. And we really thought that squirrels would be more resistant towards our Southern Pacific rattlesnakes, whereas wood rats would be more resistant towards our red diamond rattlesnakes. And finally, our fourth hypothesis is trying to get at that idea of local adaptation. So we assume that mammals will be more resistant towards the venom of their sympatric populations of their main snake predator than from their allopatric populations. Um, and so this is a little bit different than what Matt Holding had found in his study. Um, and our hypothesis stems from this idea that snakes are longer lived and our mammals have shorter generation times and that life dinner principle so the life dinner principle you know is just simply that these squirrels that interact with the rattlesnake that's life or death for them in that interaction but for the snake it just means that they're missing a meal if they don't eat that time so we assume that the selective pressure should be a lot more intense on our mammals and that's what's really informing this last hypothesis so in order to assess all of these hypotheses we had all those mammals and snakes at four different sites in san diego county which is outlined here in black so we had Camp Pendleton, which was in the north, the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, Mission Trails, which is right down in San Diego, and then Rancho Humul Ecological Reserve, which is down south near the border. And the yellow is just denoting some urbanization areas so that you can see kind of the isolation due to the urbanization. So we collected roughly 10 individuals of each one of the species that I previously mentioned. We collected mammals through live trapping. Um, once I live trapped them, I would anesthetize them, take various body measurements, gave them their unique ear tags, and then took uh, cardiac punctures to obtain blood samples. And then when the mammals uh, recovered from their anesthesia, I released them at their site. Snakes, unfortunately, cannot be trapped. So that was found through endless hours of visual surveys to collect those guys. Uh, I took them back to our vivarium at San Diego State, where I again anesthetized them, took various body and head measurements, I pit tagged them, and then I extracted their venoms. And so once again, once they were fully recovered, I also released the rattlesnakes back at their collection points. And so by using these blood and these venom samples, we can conduct a whole bunch of lab methods in order to actually assess the venom composition, the venom efficacy, as well as the resistance of these mammals. So to start, um, we did a venom analysis and I say we, but I mean Dr. Anthony Saviola at Scripps. Um, he did a lot of this venom proteomics work for us. He ran some shotgun proteomics just to give us some mass spectrometry, which was used to characterize the protein families in our venoms. And then he used spectral counting in order to get a relative abundance of those protein families in each of our venom samples. And so we ended up deciding to pool all of our venom samples rather than take individuals. We were finding that there was quite a bit of variation in our individual's venom efficacy. So we really wanted to just capture the entire population rather than the individuals. And so we ended up pooling our, all of our venoms for our venom analysis, as well as for the subsequent um, venom resistance analysis. So some more lab methods that we did. Uh, those, um, the, the SVMPs and the SVMPIs are just proteins. So I did a crude protein count um, just to get an idea of what's in there. And that way I was actually able to uh, dilute those samples down in order to get standard concentrations to run this SVMP activity assay. So the SVMP activity assay is a fluorescing metalloproteinase digestive gel, which is like the worst four words I've ever heard put together, I think. So I made an animation to clarify what that is even doing. And just simply what it is, is that when we add venom, which is denoted by this teardrop, into this gel, those SVMPs in that venom will digest that gel down. And as it digests the gel, it will then fluoresce. And then that fluorescence can be read by a microplate reader. So the more efficient the venom is, the more it's going to digest the gel and the more it's going to fluoresce. Therefore, if we incubate that venom with serum prior to running these assays, now those SVMPIs can bind to the SVMPs. Therefore, that should reduce the gel, uh, the digestion of that gel, and it should result in a lower fluorescence level. So the, the more resistant a mammal is, the less it should fluoresce. And by conducting venom only assays with venom incubated with serum assays, we could then just calculate a percent resistance with a simple rate equation. 
<clears throat> but to actually assess any patterns of resistance, we have to do a whole bunch of pairings of venoms and serums. And so within each of our sites, we paired our Southern Pacific rattlesnake venom with our California ground squirrel serum. And then we also paired our red diamond rattlesnake venom with our Bryant's wood rat serum. Also likewise within the same population, we crossed them. So we tested Southern Pacific venom against our Bryant's wood rats and our red diamond rattlesnakes against our California ground squirrels. And so again, this is all done within one same population. And we did this in order to be able to assess individuals venom resistance and the population's venom resistance as well as a species difference. But to get at that idea of local adaptation, we had to do a little bit different of pairings, obviously. And so we, within each site, we actually focused a little bit more just on the, um, the relationships that we thought were most coevolutionary relevant. So meaning the ground squirrels and our Southern Pacific rattlesnakes. And then we just did our pairings between our wood rats and our red diamond rattlesnakes. So between all of our sites, we took those 10 individuals from each site. They were tested against their sympatric venom pool as well as the three allopatric venom pools. So again, we just took the, for instance, our 10 California ground squirrels from Camp Pendleton, tested them against their Camp Pendleton venom pool, as well as the Rancho Homul pool, the uh, Mission Trails venom pool, as, and the um, Safari Park venom pool. So after we focused California ground squirrels in, in Southern Pacifics, we did the exact same thing with our wood rats and our red diamond venoms. So this should hopefully have given us enough of the information in order to actually assess those four hypotheses that I discussed earlier. So I'm gonna be moving into the results now. Um, and so before I give you all the results, I'm gonna give you, remind you what the hypothesis was. I'll probably give you like an expected results figure or table just so I can, you guys can get oriented with it before I show you the actual results. So just to remind you of what that first hypothesis was. We were looking at that snake's venom composition and how we thought it was going to be variable between all these species and the population levels. So again, this table might be a little bit overwhelming, but what you're going to see across the top here is a bunch of acronyms for venom protein families. And I'm not going to go into all of them, although they're all important. Uh, we're really focusing in on just a couple of portions. So you'll see all the protein families, the species we're looking at, so our red diamond rattlesnakes here, and then each one of these is going to be our sites that we looked at. So the SVMPs, which are going to be one of the more prominent things that I'll be talking about, are contained within these five columns right here. So those will be a main focus. The next thing you're going to see in this table is that it's either going to be red or blue. And so all that red means is that these are enzymatic proteins, which are more reflective of that type 1 venom. And the blue squares are be more non-enzymatic proteins, just meaning it's more reflective of that type two venom. And then finally, you're gonna see a whole bunch of numbers throughout every single one of these tables. I promise I do figures from here on out, so this is like the worst table you have to look at. But in this, you'll see all these different numbers. And these different numbers just are identified proteins that were based on unique peptide sequences. And so what all of this is going to find, our first result for our red diamond rattlesnakes is what we found is that that venom is actually really highly conserved across all of our sites. Basically just meaning that all of these protein families show up basically at every single one of our sites. The same number of unique peptides are pretty much shown in most of our sites as well. So it's just that our red diamond venom is pretty reflective of one another at all of our sites. And what you'll also see here is that this red venom is, uh, or the red diamond venom is really dominated by these red boxes, which just is again reflective saying that there's a lot of proteoly uh, proteolytic enzymes in that venom, which is really typical of that type one venom that we would see. What else is really interesting to note that we found here is that those SVMPs are found in really large quantities in this venom. So it's very dense. As you can see, there's a lot of, a lot of unique peptides that were found. Um, and again, just um, a lot of higher amounts, which again is just typical of what we would expect to see in that type one venom. But in comparison, our Southern Pacifics, just looking across all the sites again, that venom is pretty much highly conserved across all of our sites, just meaning again, same protein families show up, same number of unique peptides show up. But what's really interesting is that this venom is actually a lot more dominated by those blues. So this venom we would have assumed at some point to be more type one is actually more of a type two type venom. It's dominated by these non-enzymatic proteins and has a lot fewer proteolytic enzymes. And specifically, if you look at those SVMPs again, 
they don't even have four of those columns showing up in their venoms. And the only ones that do are these P3s and they're just in really low amounts as well. So we wanted to look into this a little bit farther. We're like, if what, what are these snakes using in their venoms? Um, and so we wanted to get a relative abundance of all these different families. So we broke the uh, Southern Pacific's venom down into a, using that spectral counting to actually get a relative abundance. And so on this figure, again, it's gonna be those same exact protein families you just saw in the last figure. But on our Y axis now, we have a relative abundance of those proteins. And then each one of our sites is denoted by a different color. So what I want you to focus in on here again are these SVMPs. They're just really, really low in abundance, um, not even making up 0.1% of this venom, but they do have these really high amounts of these calocrine-like enzymes, which wasn't necessarily seen in our red diamonds either. And as you can see across all these sites, they're a little bit more variable in relative abundance between one another. Specifically, this myotoxin in our one in our one population of Mission Trails rattlesnakes, they have a crazy amount of myotoxins. Most of their venom is actually composed of that at this point. So, what does this mean? All of this, all of these protein families, I'm just throwing out at you. Um, what is so? What we are finding is that in this range shown in these maps, um, where our Southern Pacific here in blue in San Diego and our red diamonds are in red. When these two species are coexisting, what we find is that the Southern Pacific venom has a lot fewer SVMPs, more basic peptides, and just more of those myotoxins. So again, more reflective of that type two venom. But what makes this really interesting is that previous studies on Southern Pacifics, where they were in populations that don't coexist with red diamond rattlesnakes, they're actually expressing more of a typical type one venom, that they have a lot more SVMPs and those proteolytic enzymes that are typical of vipers. So just north of this range up here, these guys, all these snakes have a lot heavier in SVMP venoms, but as they move south and where they coexist with our red diamond rattlesnakes, they're diverging in their venom types and becoming a type two venom. And so one possible explanation of what's happening is that these animals are experiencing character displacement in their venom types. So character displacement is just the evolution of enhanced differences between two species in the same geographic location that use the same resources due to uh, selection against one or both of those members. And so character displacement is much more likely to evolve in traits that have abundant um, interspecific variation, just like venom has. <clears throat> and so it's really interesting to see that these two species that when they're coexisting, they might actually be diverging in their venoms um, to avoid you know, some competition or give a little bit of a release there. Obviously we didn't test specifically for character displacement. So there, we need some more fine scale study to follow up with this. But it's a really interesting um, suggestion that this preliminary results are, might be leading towards this character displacement of venom. And I'm going to go into a bit more of, of how this venom, this character displacement and venom might actually be impacting coevolution towards the end. So I'm going to give you guys all my results and then I'll wrap it up with like how all this really impact, impacts coevolution. But so now to move away from this venom and move on to venom resistance. We move on to our second hypothesis, which is just that individuals resistance towards one snake species is not predictive of their resistance towards another snake species. And so for our expected results, again, uh, I just want to familiarize you with the figures. Our X axis here is going to be the resistance towards the red diamond venoms and our Y axis will be the resistance towards their southern Pacific venoms. And then each site again is going to be denoted by um, a different color here. And so if we were to expect that this hypothesis to be supported, we would see something like this in the figure where it's a really flat line denoting that these individuals have really high resistance towards our red diamonds, but really low resistance towards our Southern Pacific venoms. And that is in fact, exactly what we found. We found that these individuals, which are shown in each of these dots, you have this crazy variation where they have really high resistance towards one species, but like no resistance towards another species just showing again that it's not necessarily predictive of one another, that they don't just have this baseline uh, percent resistance venom. And so we also actually found this for, again, our wood rats as well. So three of our four sites here, you'll see this really, really flat lines, just again, denoting that they typically seem to be resistant towards one species, but not very resistant towards the other species, or at least not predictive of one another at um, a, whole, a whole level. And so <clears throat> what, 
you guys also might be seeing now is that this mission trails, right, has a really steep line. You're like, wait, that should be predictive, right? But if you actually look at these numbers in the axes, not a single mammal in our mission trails population was resistant towards like any of the Southern Pacific venoms and only a few of them are resistant towards our red diamond rattlesnakes. So it's really just these negative values that are really, really driving that relationship to be so steep like that. When in fact, like half of them can't resist any type of venom at all. But what does this mean? And to me, this means that this venom resistance is not this functionally generalized trait. And so that means that these SVMPIs, these inhibitors, when they are mixing with those SVMPs in the venoms, they're not like on a molecular level interacting with one another in the exact same way. Meaning that they probably have different binding affinities. They might be binding in different locations. They're just interacting in a different way. So it just means that when those mammals are interacting with a new venom every time, they might not be the same exact venom resistance level every single time. And again, this is gonna have further implications for their co-evolution of these species that I'll discuss a little bit later. But our third hypothesis is that those mammals are gonna be more resistant towards the SVMPs of rattlesnake species that most commonly preys upon them. Again, meaning that our red diamond, our wood rats should be more resistant towards red diamonds and our squirrels should be more resistant towards our Southern Pacifics. And so for our expected results here, these graphs, you will see our snake species on the X axis. And then our Y axis is just gonna be again that relative percent venom resistance. So basically individuals that show up really high in the graph will be really resistant. Anything that shows up very low in the graph is really low resistance. And so again, if we were to expect that they would be uh, more resistant towards that, that species that commonly preys upon them, for squirrels, we would expect something like this, where we have this really sharp line again, showing that they have high resistance towards our Southern Pacifics, but really low against the red diamonds. And that is in fact, not at all what we found. So what we actually found, looking at this at a whole species level, is that our squirrels are pretty much showing the same resistance across both um, species of snakes that they're encountering. And so again, this analysis was a pooled sample of all of our squirrels towards red diamond venoms and all of our um, Southern Pacifics towards squirrels. So a bit different than the previous analysis I was just showing you. But again, for our wood rats, we also found that there was no specialization. So we saw that our wood rats, again, were exhibiting pretty similar levels of venom resistance towards either one of our species. And so again, at the species level, we're not really seeing the specialization, which led us to want to look at population level differences to see if populations are all responding the same. And so these figures are going to be a little bit different, where our mammal site is now on our x-axis. Our y-axis is still that relative percent venom resistance. And then each of our snake species is gonna show up as a red line for red diamonds or a bluish green line for our Southern Pacifics. So looking at squirrels, uh, what we expected was that the squirrel venom resistance is gonna be different between populations. And that is what we found. So our results suggest that these populations are acting differently and they're showing different levels of venom resistance. However, if you start to look at this graph a little bit longer, you'll notice that a lot of those confidence intervals overlap. And so we did some post hoc analysis. And what we really can tell is that there's only two populations really driving these trends. So mission trails here, um, these squirrels ex express on average 40% less resistance towards Southern Pacifics than any other site does. And likewise, for our red diamonds, those squirrels at Safari Park are showing about 37% less resistance on average towards their red diamonds than at all other sites. So it's really just these two sites that are really driving that site to site differentiation that we are finding. And similarly, with our wood rats, we also found that there is population level differences. But when you get a little bit closer here, looking into these, again, you'll notice a lot of these confidence intervals overlap between all of our populations which just is showing that it's actually, again, that mission trails wood rat population is really driving this relationship for site to site differences. Um, as you'll notice, not a single wood rat could resist the venom of red diamond rattlesnakes or Southern Pacifics really. And so uh, this again is gonna have major implications uh, for their site to site variation and in co-evolution. But before I get onto the whole co-evolution and impacts, I just wanna uh, touch on that last hypothesis that our mammals are gonna be more resistant towards those venom of sympatric populations than their main predator than from allopatric populations. And so with these figures, you're gonna see our snake sites are now across our X axis. And then that Y axis is still gonna be that relative percent venom resistance. 
And each one of our sites, once again, is going to show up as a different color. So these are going to be our mammal sites on, um, that show up as bar graphs. And so what you're going to see if we saw this expected result being supported is something like this, where each one of these bars, again, represents that mammal venom resistance population. And when it's outlined in a thick black bar, that just means it's a sympatric pairing, meaning that that is Camp Pendleton's pairing against Camp Pendleton's venom. Whereas the other sites that are not outlined are going to be your allopatric pairings. So if our mammals were locally adapted, what our graph should look like is something nice and clean like this, where you have those really thick bars um, showing up higher on every single population than they do against the allopatric. And so this is in fact also not at all what we found. <laughs> so again, we did not find any semblance of local adaptation by these squirrels. If you really look into this figure, you have right for the Camp Pendleton snake site, pretty much all of our mammals at all four sites had about the same venom resistance towards those Camp Pendleton snakes. Uh, likewise, mission trails here, our squirrels were just kind of decimated by the Southern Pacific venom and not a single one could really um, just battle that at all. Um, and Rancho Hamul, again, they just didn't do very well. And the only site maybe is Safari Park that is up high, but as you can see, they're all pretty well, the same venom resistance levels. So no, no signal of local adaptation there. And just like the wood rats, also no signal of local adaptation was uh, found. So if you look at this graph, once again, we have those dark bars and not in any single population do they really show up as the highest. Except for Mission Trails here, which does show up that it's like locally adapted. However, not a single other mammal species could actually even, again, combat that venom. And so although this patch, they did well, they did really a lot better when they were at other sites. But if you stare at this graph a little bit longer, you might actually notice that at three of our four sites, those sympatric pairings of mammals did really poorly. And what that is implying actually is that our red diamond rattlesnake venom is locally adapted. So as you see here, our Camp Pendleton squirrels did, or wood rats did the worst against uh, their Camp Pendleton snakes. Same with our Rancho Hamul population did really poorly against their own snakes and same with Safari Park. They all just did really, really poorly against their own population of snakes, which again just implies that these, rattle, these red diamond rattlesnakes venom is locally adapted to best overcome their local wood rat populations. And so just to recap all these tons of variation I just threw at you, um, previous research has found variation in different uh, of resistance towards different snake species. However, that's not particularly what we found um, in our study. There's a couple of reasons why we may have not seen this. The first one is due to this small geographic area. So a lot of those other previous studies that have found this snake difference, they tend to be over really large geographic ranges, such as that rock squirrel range or even Matt Holdings, um, all of California range. Versus ours, I don't, our farthest apart sites are maybe 60 kilometers apart from each other. So they're all very close to each other. On top of that, there's actually also a third rattlesnake species that coexists with most of these snakes, and that is our speckled rattlesnake. So there could be some implications due to the fact that these snakes, these mammals are not only experiencing red diamond rattlesnake venom and southern Pacific rattlesnake venom, but they also have to be wary of a third predator of a third species of the speckled rattlesnakes. And so we might just not see that specialization occurring with so many different interacting players. We also found that us and other researchers have found that there are population level differences. And so again, our results, we found them, but we found that it was really just a couple of populations really driving those results. And so again, this could be due to that small geographic range that we are looking at, as well as the recent expansion of San Diego uh, urban areas comparatively to other studies, which again are over these large geographic ranges, which have um, huge amounts of uh, variation and er heterogeneity in the environment that actually may have kept those populations separated forever versus San Diego, which has just recently been um, starting to expand. It's just the recent expansion is the only thing that actually started separating these populations from one another. And then finally, uh, Matt Holding's study found that these patterns of local adaptation between snake venom, uh, between squirrels and Northern Pacifics. And our results, we actually only found that, uh, that local adaptation with our red diamond rattlesnakes. We didn't see the same trend with our Southern Pacifics and our ground squirrels. And again, a couple of reasons why could be that in Northern California, those Northern Pacific snakes rely a lot more on squirrels for their main prey item than they do in the South. So in the South, they just have a lot more other um, prey items available to them. 
And again, on top of that, these mammals have many predators down south. So this might just be favoring this more generalized inhibitor rather than any specialization. So what does all of this mean in terms of the co-evolution of these species? So we found this geographic variation in venom chemistry and resistance that was to be expected underneath that geographic mosaic theory. We found some areas of hot spots and cold spots, um, maybe not as pronounced as other studies have found them, but there is quite a bit of that variation. So these mammals might be more subjected to these shifting selective pressures because they have these multiple predators that might create more of a diffuse coevolution that favors this generalist strategy. So rather than a tight pairwise coevolution that has been seen in many other studies, especially even in those Northern Pacific rattlesnakes and ground squirrels, ours might be do, doing more of this diffuse coevolution, which is just a coevolution among a suite of species. And it's because they have multiple predators and shifting venom types and everything else that these mammals are dealing with. And it has been shown that having predators with uh, similar predators does weaken that pairwise coevolution. And again, so these, the snake character displacement, this venom phenotypes could be having major implications for these rattles, these mammals. So if they are in, having these SVMP inhibitors, that's really seems to be only really effective against our red diamond venoms that have those SVMPs. Our, our Southern Pacific rattlesnake venom is not really reflecting any of those SVMPs. And so that inhibition might actually not really be a great strategy when they're facing um, Southern Pacific rattlesnake venoms. So not only are these mammals dealing with three rattlesnake predators, they're dealing with two different types of venoms on top of that. And then within that, those venom, ice, the SVMPs and all of our venoms are likely interacting differently with those inhibitors. So these mammals have a huge feat ahead of them to try to keep up in this co-evolutionary relationship um, with these rattlesnakes. And so where do we go from here? There's so much still unknown about this system. Um, I really think that some molecular analyses of our SVMPIs, our inhibitors, is a really important next step. We haven't quite uh, classified those or characterized those to really understand how those, the SVMPs and the inhibitors are really binding to one another. I think that's really important to try to understand. Um, and what I also find really, really interesting is this individual variation. So in this figure, we just again have our sites um, across our X axes. And then our Y axis is that relative venom percentage. And if you see, we have all of our squirrels and wood rats laid on here. And so even within one single population, you can have somebody that is almost 90% resistant towards venom versus somebody that has absolutely no venom resistance at all. And it's not quite known what's driving these variations of individuals. Um, we don't know if it's genetics, environmental, physiological, or what is actually driving this. So I think it's a fascinating area to go down is trying to understand why these individuals are even different. Um, and along those lines is this idea of constraints, being constrained from actually evolving venom resistance or high levels of venom resistance. Um, so these inhibitors are part of the alpha-1 antitrypsin inhibitor pro, um, family, which just means that they're part of the immune system response and they're produced by your liver. And so previous studies, um, one that I think it was just published this last year by Matt Holding and uh, Brie Putman and Rula and Clark showed that these mammals that are in better body condition are actually experiencing a higher venom resistance. And so there might be this idea of this trade-off that there's a physiological trade-off for them to produce these inhibitor proteins. And so those that are in really bad body condition might be fighting other battles. So like a daily, if they're fighting a disease, they might not be able to allocate that energy to produce those inhibitor proteins um, versus when they can just produce all the other things that they need to do to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I just think there's a fascinating avenue trying to understand why none of these animals are just completely immune to venom. And so with that, uh, I just want to thank my uh, funding sources, our SSAR and SICBI and San Diego Zoo and SDSU, as well as obviously Roland Clark and Matt Holding, Malachi Whitford and Anthony Saviola for all their work on this project with me. Um, JP Montag and Jeff Lem for helping me out at Safari Park catching snakes and uh, squirrels there, which I worked in a dump and it was not fun. Um, but the Clark Lab members and all the, I had like 20 plus undergrads, I would never been able to get all this work done without them. As well as the Fish and Wildlife, Mission Trails staff, the San Diego staff and the Camp Pendleton Game Warden's office for their help and continued access to the lands. And so with that, I can take any questions you guys may have. So maybe we could unmute for a moment and have a little uh, clapping for Kelly's uh, <laughs> awesome talk.
can't see one another because we're still on the shared screen, but. Oh yeah, sorry, I can stop sharing. Laugh a little. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have uh, questions for Kelly? We could either, you could either voice them directly or post them to the chat if you have a question or raise your hand if you're interested. Yeah. Paul has a question. Paul, I think that's a good, yeah. <laughs> May I, I ask a sort of a, a couple part question. Has there been in vivo tests? I mean, what do you, what happens to the squirrel when it gets bitten in populations that have some resistance? Yeah, so uh, there was at least one study I know from way back when, um, and they found that there's no like lasting repercussions um, for them getting envenomated if they're highly resistant. Um, they'll get some of some of that cell destruction um, immediately as well, but they can usually recoup that and regenerate all that for the most part. Have you seen the the video, the crazy badass honey badger? Probably, yeah, maybe at some some point. I think I, I posted it in the chat. You have to watch it. Oh, it's awesome. a badger that's eating cobras, and it gets bitten, and it in the middle of eating the cobra, it drops dead. <laughs> Oh no! And, and it sorry. wakes up and finishes eating the cobra. <laughs> uh, the, but the other part of the question was, you haven't mentioned the volume of venom that's injected, and that's got to be another variable. So if a snake is losing some effectiveness, does it increase the volume that it injects? That would that work? That. Oops, sorry. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I believe Bill Hayes would probably be the best person to ever answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know a ton about their dosage levels, but I do know that there's some studies showing that they can somewhat control that. But I would absolutely assume that if they, you know, if they have that choice and they're having a less efficient venom, they would probably try to use all of their venom. Um, I think to tend in offensive strikes, they tend to expel most of their venom when they are offensively striking anyway, um, just because they want to write, just get as much of that venom in there as they possibly can to try to counteract any of this resistance or anything to really try to subdue that animal. But that allows them then to compensate by producing larger venom stores. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine, I would imagine it would, yeah. Interesting. I'm sure there are additional questions for Kelly. <laughs> I don't I have a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, good, cool talk, Kelly. It was great. Um, I was wondering if there's, a, do you know if there's like a ontogenetic change in the venom immunity for the, say, like a, the ground squirrels? That is a great question. I don't believe it is known. So that's a, um, yeah, that's a great question. I would also love to know that. <laughs> um, if there is some sort of like even maternal effect or something, some sort of shift in um, their ontogeny, yeah. Um, I Yeah, nobody has looked at it. That's a great question. I think what we really need is somebody who is willing to captively have a colony of squirrels. I don't know anybody who's crazy enough to do it, but to have a really captive co colony so we can really understand how like the different selective pressures that are really changing that. Um, but that would be great. I also very much wanted to look at seasonality along those same lines, because right in the South, we don't have that much season difference, but in the North they do. And so I was curious if they could kind of um, upregulate or downregulate their venom resistance in terms of need, like during certain seasons. Um, I unfortunately did not have enough time to also do that. But I think that would be really interesting to know this ontogenic shift as well as to see if there's any seasonal influence, like when they aren't really seeing rattlesnakes, do they downregulate because they don't really need to produce those inhibitors at that point? Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Tim, yeah. Uh, so that was a great talk. Uh, the question I have is um, I was thinking about it in terms of the co evolutionary story, that critically depends on time for adaptation. So I was wondering if you had considered maybe like, doing some ecological niche models for all the different players and seeing how much their ranges overlap in the past. Because I wonder if there might've been kind of co-adaptation in the past that um, now is showing as like maladaptation in the present. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I have it. But I do know that, um, and it's gonna be really bad, I only partially just read this dissertation um, a few days ago that actually did a lot of niche modeling on uh, the Crotalus heleri and Ruber. And I can't remember exactly, I think they were looking more for niche partitioning in which they didn't find. Um, <coughs> 
but it would be really interesting to do. I would love to do an evolutionary history more uh, aspect of this to see how those fluctuated and changed over times. But that would be a great, doing some niche modeling would be really awesome to do. I think that maybe you could see that, yeah. <laughs> really cool. Tim Gregory? Hi, quick. Um, um, I wondered if you'd ever considered um, selecting from some of the Southern Pacific uh, populations that are very close to the coast, like at Torrey Pines, for example, where there are no red, the, where the other two uh, right. protoists don't occur. Right. Yeah, no, um, I haven't, but I will definitely tell Ruland that he should have somebody do that because that would be really interesting to find out to see what kind of venoms they really have um, sitting in that spot. You're like, because you're right, they don't really coexist with one another and they're so much closer geographically. It would be really interesting to see if there's that differentiation that you're seeing up north or not. Plus, it'd be great to work in Torrey Pines. You can't really complain there. <laughs> yeah, there certainly used to be a lot of snakes there. Yeah, you know, the, all the times I hiked out there, I don't. I think I maybe saw one rattlesnake the whole time, but you know, who knows? There's just so many people nowadays. <laughs> Along the same lines, the Coronado Islands have just Crotalus organis. They don't have river. Yeah, yeah. So my um, lab mate uh, is was looking at the uh, the Mexican Coronado Island. He collected a lot of those snakes. Um, I'm not sure we had enough of those venom samples at the time to run the analysis on that venom. But I'm hoping that that's like something future that we could follow up with is I'm almost positive he's got those samples from those guys. So it'd be great to run those as well to see if there's any difference. Yeah, there's been a fair amount of time there for, for evolution, right? I mean, you've got at least 10,000 years probably. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And with that whole like the islandization of all of them too, yeah. <laughs> So I have a question. So, oh, actually, uh, Becca has a question. She has her hand up. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs> um, yeah, just thinking about, uh, I don't know, I don't remember if it's Ammon or, or Kevin that asked about the ontogenetic changes in the squirrels. I, I've heard anecdotally from Jen Smith, who, who actually studies the ground squirrel, California ground squirrel population here in the, the East Bay, that um, juveniles are, are not very resistant uh, and adults are, and that the adults will try to kind of like somewhat behaviorally protect the juveniles. So that does suggest yeah. it's, it might be plastic or, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of the assumption that I'm kind of thinking more is that it's kind of a plastic trait. And again, as they're young, they're trying to develop all these antibodies and everything else right in their immune system to just like function. And so there uh -huh. could be in that like semblance of trade off that it's like they get protected by their mothers and whatever they don't necessarily need that inhibitor protein on top of it. Um, so there might be some sort of trade off there. But that would be yeah, that's really interesting, though, to find that I like, yeah, I don't do much mammals, but the mammal behavior is really interesting. <laughs> but so I've heard criticisms about like the metabolic cost of, of protein. So I'm curious. I know you literally just said you don't know too much about the, or you haven't um, really studied the mammal uh, side, but um, is there much actual empirical evidence for metabolic cost of, of producing more of these, you know, resistance proteins or? Um, not, not to my knowledge right now. Um, I would say, again, I've been out of the system for a little bit too. So I was trying to dive back into some more of the, the current stuff. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody has truly tested for like the metabolic cost. Um, it's more just we keep finding these implications of like these treats. So it's definitely an avenue that needs to be explored. Um, I do know that there's, I think a recent study that I don't know if it's come out yet or it's coming out, but it's showing that this venom resistance is actually really influenced by temperature. So there's like a weird influence of like external temperature, which is kind of strange because they're, you know, not ectotherms. So <laughs> it's kind of weird that they're being influenced by that. But yeah, to my knowledge, there's not really a metabolic test quite yet, uh, but it's definitely something that needs to be done to understand that. Does the, does the test, this kind of uh, ties into the question I had, does the, does the uh, cost have to be metabolic? I mean, it seems almost certainly that there's a cost, but maybe it induces some sort of physiological constraint they can't run as well or they're less you know, effective at avoiding other kinds of predators when they're dealing with this? Yeah, I, I'm actually not 100% sure. Yeah, 
I'm not sure, but you're totally right. So uh, with like the newts and garter snakes, right? They did find a trade-off in like the skeletal muscle of these snakes that they can't have that resistance. I mean, that's like a genetic mutation that does slow them down. So it's a little bit different, but there could absolutely still be this like metabolic or uh, physiological trade-off that, you know, something's not working as properly when they have this higher venom resistance as well. Totally. Yeah. I would love to throw it on like a myography machine and put some muscle on there and see what happens. All right. That's your postdoc. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carol, do you have a question? Um, yeah. Hi, Kelly. Nice to meet you virtually. Um, you. I want to know, um, do you think that by pooling, so you're pooling the venom samples of the snakes because basically you had such a huge variation in the amount of venom you got, right? And Not I'm the amount, um, the efficiency of the venom. So when we were running them in our assay, there was just some individuals that were like pretty really efficient at their vet, uh, digesting that gel down and then ones that were not very efficient. Oh, I see. Sorry, okay. I'll let you finish your question. Okay, well, I guess uh, that sort of changes a little bit. Then, but anyway, but do you think that that may affect your results? Like, could there be individual mammals that are more um, resistant to sort of some individual snakes, but then you're sort of pooling everything together. So you're not seeing the snakes as individuals really at all. So. Yeah, so, so that was the trade-off that we chose to go with because we originally had been doing some individual pairings similar to what Matt Holding was doing. We just did individuals. But we were finding that, that, that variation in efficiency and then we were just kind of worried that we were just gonna be like, if you get a mammal, right? So it's all relative venom percent resistance. It's not like a flat line. And so if you take, you know, a, let's just say arbitrarily, this, the squirrel is super resistant and then it gets a really, really efficient venom, it's going to come out in that assay as being like really low resistance. But if that same squirrel like got a, a really bad venom sample, just like randomly paired with it, then it would have been, you know, really crazy efficient. So we kind of had this trade-off discussion about like, what's the best way to truly compare these venom resistance values across these populations and we just thought that, you know, pooling them all, yeah, you preclude the individual variation, which is definitely something we want to go down that at rabbit hole at some point. But we were more concerned that that would just really drive some really um, results in the resistance that weren't really accurate. Um, so yeah, there is that trade off for sure. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That makes sense. Yeah. I'll just note that Becca indicated in the, uh, the chat that maybe heat shock proteins could be involved in the topic we were just discussing. Totally. Uh, Mike? Hey, Jim. Thank you. Great presentation, Kelly. Thanks. Hey, um, back to the potential for ontogenetic shift and uh, uh, Rebecca's question. I know that the organic populations over along the American River in Sacramento um, prey heavily on the squirrel pups. I, I mean, they eat a lot of pups, and yet uh, you don't find them able to prey on adult squirrels. In fact, we used to see occasionally adult squirrels with big scabs on their rumps, um, that we assumed were healing uh, snake bites, but um, they were able to, the snakes were able to kill and eat the pups and, and did so throughout the summer. So I can't remember if it was in the early literature or maybe um, a discussion that Matt Holden and I had uh, years ago, but there was some um, thought about whether or not the squirrels either, did they produce or not produce the antibodies when they were small or did they just not have enough body volume enough blood volume to have enough antibodies in their system to uh, neutralize enough uh, snake venom to survive the bites don't know but they do definitely prey on the pups totally and that's a, that's the other thing i meant to mention when you asked that question rebecca was that yeah like the volume just if you have more blood you're going to have more of these proteins in theory anyway right so if you're small you might not just have enough anyway and yeah so but totally, yeah, that's really interesting to find that though, it's like anecdotally that you can totally see them just destroying pups somewhere, but not the adults. That's really cool. <laughs> well, terrible, I guess, if you're a mammal, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I see Paul has a virtual hand raised. <laughs> yeah, um, first of all, a great talk, Kelly, uh, really cool stuff. Um, so I had two questions and I, I guess the second, whether you'll answer the second question will depend on what the answer to the first question is. Um, but so when, when you say, um, when you showed us the behavioral um, adaptations, right? So do, do these, do, uh, do prey have both venom and behavioral to any? Yeah, yes and no to some degree. So I believe like kangaroo rats aren't particularly resistant towards venom, 
but they do have all those crazy adaptations, like the really high jump backs. They do these foot drummings. They are like, they'll bury those guys in sand. Um, but the, the squirrels have a lot of the, they have do that tail flagging, which is more of like a signal and they have really high venom resistance. So I'm not sure if anybody has actually like lined those up side by side to see if they actually have both. But I would imagine that they still have a lot of those anti-predator behaviors just because those mammals are also being predated upon by like coyotes, foxes, you know, everything else kind of is also. So they still need right. to be able to like defend themselves against other stuff too. So I would right. imagine they would, but. I, I was just curious because that, that would mean, um, I mean, so if, if they're sequential, right? So if behavior doesn't work, then the selection moves to the venom. Uh, speaking simplistically, but so it would be interesting to see if uh, the, the ones that do behavior have uh, are less resistant to um, some of these snakes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be really interesting to find out if there's, there's some semblance of level of that. Yeah, I'm not sure if people have really looked at that much. I'm not sure um, about squirrels having like more defenses rather than just like their veracity, like they're just vicious little things, you know, with their claws and their teeth and their tail flagging for the most part, I think are just like a lot of their um, anti-predator defenses. But yeah, it'd be really interesting to find more, find a little bit more trade-off in that and see if there's, see if there's something there. Right, cool, thank you. Yeah, well, thanks. I'll go ahead and ask Kevin's question for him since he oh, posted yeah. it in the chat. Um, he asked about king snakes and I mean, I, it's curious, are king snakes? I mean, my sense is that they're resistant to like all these rattlesnakes, but are they really resistant to all rattlesnakes? And if so, how is it that they're resistant to all of them with all these different complex venoms and the squirrels aren't? And then if that's also the case, would you consider studying those at some point in the future? Yeah, I would love to. So we also actually definitely threw a couple of king snake samples onto some of my plates when I was doing them, um, just because we were just like curious to see if it would work the same. Um, we found, yeah, we just found some variable results. Obviously, we only threw like two king snakes on there. So it's not much to say of anything at that point. But yeah, I don't know if they're, that's like one system that really I feel personally hasn't really been like d dove into very like well. Um, we've known that they're resistant forever, but I'm not even sure if people really know that mechanism like down pat. Somebody else who's a little bit more verbose in all of this might know, but I don't even think we have that mechanism particularly down. Um, so who knows? They could be deploying a bunch of different these mechanisms. So the inhibitor proteins in mammals, um, they work in a couple of different ways. So there's some that irreversibly bind like the versions I was talking about. And there's others that create molecular cages around the aspects of the venom. So it like traps it rather. And so who knows this king snakes could be deploying a couple of those, um, the, protein, the proteins being relatively not expensive to make for them or whatnot. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, you see king snakes eating like everything. So I'm not sure if there's, I don't know how they fare against like a Mojave green or something, but. <laughs> I would love to do that system. I love king snakes and rattlesnakes, so it'd be great. So I saw that Cannon had his hand up for a moment, but his hand went down. Are you still? You still have a question, Cannon? Yeah. So um, I was debating whether to ask it because he partially answered, but um, I was just wondering: is there been any other research into like uh, methods of resistance to the other components of the snake venom, or has it been solely focused on the uh, malaproteinases? Most of it has been focused on the metalloproteinase, um, like historically, but there are, so um, holding it all, I think 2016 as well, um, his other study, he does kind of summary review and he breaks down the different components of resistance that they've seen. Primarily, there are pretty much always those SVMP inhibitors because I think that's like really important to break down, right? They really stop that initial destruction of cells. So it's just like the most important part to stop. But I believe they found resistance to some PLA2s um, in the venom and then in a couple of other aspects as well. But I don't think it's as strong or prominent as the SVMPs. Um, also, Gibbs, uh, I don't know if you guys are really into this, but Gibbs et al. just released a study this last year as well, 2020. And they did this sweet column affinity in which they bound the different aspects of venom to a column. And then they ran the protein, the serum through those columns to see what would actually bind to the different aspects of venom. Um, and so he definitely goes into a couple of those. Again, that one's also a lot focused on these inhibitor SVMPIs, but it does go into a little bit of the other things that are sticking because there's definitely other molecules in there that are sticking to the other aspects of the venom for sure. That's fascinating, thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. All right, this might be our last question unless another hand goes up, Chris Evelyn. Hi Kelly, definitely enjoyed the talk a lot. Um, <laughs> So I was really intrigued by that idea of the character displacement. 
And my thought, you know, looking at the, also then looking at the ranges of the two species, is the limit, is the northern limit of that Crotal's Ruber range, is that thought to be due to climate or, or a historical, some other historical factor? Yeah. Pass. That's the north edge of the peninsula ranges. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think, yeah, I think it's that pass, right? So I think it's like the geographic break kind of more. So the, yeah, Crotal Strip obviously occur all through Baja and then straight up and then they stop really at that that um, mountain range there. Yeah, I guess I was struck by, it It seemed like they have this, like you said, this really dense, efficient venom compared to the, you know, Organus hellari group. Um, but that there's maybe some more flexibility with the other species that then spreads further north I don't know, I just, I had never thought about venom components as a player in kind of the distribution of these species as much as just physiological factors or some of these geographic factors. I don't know, have you thought about that as an interaction? I mean, then there's, you know, Mitchell I obviously, which feeds more on lizards, right? More on ectotherms or? Yeah, yeah, they tend to, they tend to uh, eat a little bit more of the ectotherms, I would say. Yeah, um, I don't know. All I know is, you know, really the, the Curtis Organus seem to really have a really variable venom compared to some of the other guys. Um, you see, you see a little bit of this, um, I think, in Scutulatus, uh, in like New Mexico and Arizona and stuff, where they're kind of hybridizing in their venoms in a couple of places. Um, but you really do see this, like this, the shift here over in California with our with our Organus, um, just being in the north there, just having so many SVMPs, and then as you get south and even into the desert a little bit more. They tend to shift that venom having a lot of those myotoxins. Um, you know, they're looking for some of those Mojave green toxins, those neurom ones in that venom as well. So they just seem to be more readily, yeah, I don't know if it's just like the abundant variation in that Crotal Sorganus is just really, really high. So that venom is, has an easier time shifting um, throughout its range. Or if there's just, yeah, I'm not 100% sure exactly what's causing it, but I do seem to find that that Organus complex is really just variable and like very small regions can really change. Yeah, it, like how it seems like pretty quickly too. It must be able to do it. Yeah, yeah, seemingly pretty rapidly. I mean, so I guess it also, I mean, and I don't, I don't know. It's all speculation, but you know, as juveniles, a lot of these rattlesnakes do have that type two venom, so they don't. It's not necessarily like they're shifting. It's like they're just like not shifting their venom. So like as they age, they tend to start eating more adults. Or they tend to eat, start eating more of those mammals. But like their venom is just like not shifting along with those. Their venom is staying kind of as that more of that juvenile uh, ectotherm toxic venom. And so, is there less on oxygenetic shift with Ruber in the venom? Um, I think Ruber have similar um, similar oxygenetic shift. I'm not sure if anybody's characterized their ontogeny, uh, but I would still imagine just you know again as they're young, they just are so limited by that gape size that they have to be eating ectotherms almost. Um, and then, yeah, as they age, they would still just get that shift being the typical shift that you see across most of North American rattlesnakes. Um, so yeah, I feel like it's just this, those, uh, uh, organists that are being a little bit more weird, but. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'll, I'll ask a final question. Yeah. <laughs> Can't help myself. So I'm just <laughs> thinking about this, this trade-off that, well, this potential trade-off between producing near toxic venoms and producing these hematoxic venoms. So you have this idea that the, that the juveniles are producing a neurotoxic venom that's better for ectotherms, mm -hmm. but it's pretty good on humans as well. I mean, is there any reason to think that these neurotoxic venoms are not really effective on rodents or might there be some other sort of cost to making, to continuing to make these neurotoxic venoms? Yeah, so it's less of that it's not necessarily um, productive in like in hip, uh, subduing a mammal. But what I think previous studies, like the MACC 2010 study, um, what they're finding is that you don't typically find hemorrhagic venom and toxic venom being the same thing. So there might be like a component where the hemorrhagic venom and the toxic venom like don't work together chemically. So that's why the strategies tend to be one or the other. So like I was just mentioning too, there's this hybridization zone of, uh, I think it's Scutulatus and something else, I can't remember now, in New Mexico and uh, Arizona, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And their venoms are hybridizing. So they have both type one and type two venoms like in the same individual, but that venom is not spreading. So it's not like being a trait that's being passed on to more generations. And so it's something weird, right? That, that should be like a super venom. If you have like a crazy amount of hemorrhagic and toxicity, like you should just annihilate everything. But what they're finding is that it's actually not spreading. It's like those populations are just not, that trait's not going anywhere. It's just the same individuals. So there might be some trade off where you can't actually like chemically or physically have both of those toxins working together, if that so makes is sense. Is there a digestive 
component to this because I thought I'd read something recently that suggested that they didn't really think that the venoms were helping much with digestion, even the hemotoxic one, or even the, yeah, even the hemotoxic ones. But like, why would any large rattlesnake not want to have a near toxic venom? Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Right. Like why, why neurotoxin just seems like it would be the most efficient way to, to kill and be done. But I was always under the impression too, that a lot of that, the hemorrhagic venoms are really for that pre-digestive enzyme. They're really supposed to be for digesting all the muscle and tissue and really breaking it down before they eat them. Makes but yeah, sense. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's interesting. If you're finding any yeah, studies where it's not, then yeah. Why would you not want to just like have a crazy neurotoxin? <laughs> So my very last question for you, I've been telling students for a while now that um, that this whole thing about juvenile snakes being more rattlesnakes being more venomous than adult than rattlesnakes was was not really legit. Right. But there are onogenetic shifts in diet, but and so I guess the, and, and the potential onogenetic shifts in the in the venom, obviously, you're saying that there is. And so does that really mean that the little ones actually are more toxic for humans than the than big ones drop per drop? Um, I would still say no. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Um, I mean, it's a neurotoxin, right? Yeah. Yeah. It is a neurotoxin and stuff, but I just, I don't, yeah, I think, I think a lot of that also comes down. I know Mike, Mike's shaking his head. So he probably has a better answer for you, but I also think, you know, it is volume. So like not just drop by drop, but like a little rattlesnake, you're going to get a very little dosage compared to a full grown rattlesnake. You're going to get that, you know, that is just hospitalization immediately. And so there's not, yeah, there's a difference in toxicity um, levels. So like in mice, the LD50s are a lot lower usually in that really toxic type two venoms. But I think, yeah, I mean, maybe the neurotoxin. Yeah, I'm not really not sure why people totally have that mentality that little guys are just like, I think they just see like the little neurotic rattlesnakes. So they're like, he's going to kill me. But their venoms are yeah. really, you know, I think I would prefer a little guy versus a, a big uh, hemorrhagic venom that's going to destroy Yeah, yeah, but I, mean, heart, I don't right? want to tell my students the wrong thing about yeah, the, no, no. the toxicity, you know. Yeah, for, yeah, I was like, Mike, if you've got more opinion on that, it's like. <laughs> well, I, mean, I don't want, I want to take it a long time, but yeah, it's the volume, you know. It, the little guys, when you extract from them, just barely leave a, a half a drop of venom. And the big guys just squirt venom in the flask and and uh, produce a whole lot more venom. So even if it's more toxic, they just, the little guys don't have much. Doesn't make up the difference. All yeah, right. Drop for drop maybe, but they got a lot more drops. <laughs> so thank you so much, Kelly. It was very uh, interesting talk. I mean, very nicely presented as well. And um, thanks for putting up with all these questions. No, I love it. Battery <laughs> of questions. Um, I think at this point we should just thank Kelly again for an awesome talk. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for letting me talk about this. Hi, right, Sam. <laughs> Kelly, I was going to ask you a Wisconsin. Oh, did she go? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Did, you remember the minor league baseball team's name in Oconomowoc? Uh, I do not, but my parents are here, so I don't know if they remember. <laughs> the best minor league baseball team. Jim will like this one. The five O's. <laughs> Classic, <All right>. yes. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, Kelly. I look forward to hearing more from yeah. your work. Yeah, thank you all very much for letting me present and for the great questions. <laughs> Good to see you, Jim. Good to see you, Dave. Never Bye. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Yeah. Kelly, that was great. Thanks again. <laughs>